Hey everybody, it's Derek Martin from CodeOpinion.com. Do you get frustrated when you have to open many different files to make a change that to you seems pretty straightforward? I think one of the reasons for this is trying to apply patterns or concepts that are meant to solve problems that you don't actually have. One of the most common cases I see is trying to force the use of an aggregate from domain-driven design and not really understanding what the purpose is of an aggregate, why you would use it, and really interpreting it wrong and thinking of it really just as a data or object model. Let me show you some examples in code where I think it makes sense, as well as one where it doesn't make sense at all and you're just adding useless indirection. This video is brought to you by EventStoreDB, the stream database built from the ground up for event sourcing, CQRS, and event-driven microservices. For more on EventStoreDB, check out the link in the description. So the idea for this video came from a comment on one of my other videos where they were saying that they were a new member of a team and the code base was just kind of really hard to read. When they needed to make a change, they had to have 10 different files open and kind of jumping back and forth to try to figure out how it actually worked. This comment isn't really that unique. I hear this a lot. If you can relate to it, make sure to leave a comment. If you want to talk to other developers and get their feedback on things like this, make sure to join my channel. You can get access to a private Discord server. To learn how to join, check out the links in the description. Now, as I mentioned earlier, one of the most common things I see, especially when people are getting into domain-driven design and kind of latch on to the tactical patterns, the first thing they want to implement are aggregates. And the way that I think most people are either taught this or understand it, which I think is incorrect, is that they're usually thinking of it kind of in terms of an object model, um, like a data model. And really what they should be after is thinking of it more in terms of consistency, as a consistency boundary. So the idea here, which is always given, is if we think of an aggregate, we let's say we have a shopping, shopping basket and then the shopping basket items underneath it. So we have a basket and many potential items. Now, when people are thinking of this, they explain generally that an aggregate is, you're gonna have your aggregate root, which will be the basket. And the idea here is that all interactions that you're gonna have in terms of performing uh, state changes, whatever you're going to be doing, you're going to be calling methods on your basket that in turn will be making state changes to it or anything that has to go to the basket item. So as an example, let's say we need to add something to the basket, um, add an item, we'd be doing it to the basket. We won't be directly dealing with a basket item. So this is how people most think of it. They really think of it more in terms of an object model, a data model. And then people jump to repositories as a way to retrieve and persist your aggregate. So you have a repository that's going to return your aggregate specifically. Again, what you're going to interact with is the root, so the basket, and it's going to encapsulate everything within that aggregate. In our case, the basket item. So a repository, again, is used for uh, retrieving and persisting. So what's the problem? The problem is you're going to be adding useless indirection when you're using an aggregate and you don't actually need it. If you simply have a data model or an object model, let it be that. If you want to use an aggregate, it's because you need a consistency boundary. You need everything within the aggregate to be consistent, and that's why you're using it. Let me give an example here. So here's a sample project I found on GitHub, and there's a product entity. So this product has like an ID, name, price, and portion, which is kind of like the quantity on hand, I think. So let's look at what are the actual methods, because we have private setters, so we need methods to actually make state changes, what our behavior is. And we got set name which is really doing nothing than actually setting our property. We have set price, which is doing the exact same thing, but it has some logic here related to a specification. And I'll show that in a second. The same thing with add, which is adding to the portion and then doing some specification is the same thing with reduce. So there's not really a heck of a lot going on here, but there is validation, right? That's where the validation is supposed to go within our aggregate. So let's look at what the, um, this specification does to make sure that the price um, is correct. So we just have a one liner in our specification that the price has to be greater than zero. And we can see that our other ones here, same thing with quantity on hand, it's pretty much doing the exact same thing. It just needs to be greater than zero. Okay, that's great. So we've added validation and we're making sure we're setting correctly. Now there are other ways of dealing what I think is just trivial validation like this. And we can use value objects as a way of having the caller pass in valid values. So in the case of our price, as an example, I can create something like a product price where I force it to be in a value that, for example, whatever you pass into it 
has to be a, a positive number. It cannot be a negative number, just doing that exact same logic. And then I just have some implicit operator to turn it to a decimal. So what I can do then is where I set price, instead of changing it to a decimal, I can actually just change it to that product price type and I don't need any of that specification at all. We're forcing the caller to give us a valid price right from the get-go. And now, if you could see if I did this with the, um, the number for the quantity on hand, that portion, all we would end up having are these set methods that are really just setting properties. There really is no logic. Now let's take this a little bit further and look at where these methods of set name and set price are actually used. So if I jump over to this add command, uh, add product command handler, which is handling the add product command, we can see if the request ID uh, is null, then we're just creating a new instance. Otherwise, we're using the repository to get out this entity, this aggregate, and we're calling set name and set price directly with the values that we got from the request from that command. But again, we're not doing anything meaningful in here. We're just setting properties. So what is actually the, val the value of these methods? There are none. We'd be better off treating this just as a data model, not thinking of it as an entity or as an aggregate in an ag aggregate route. We can get rid of these useless set methods and just treat it as a data model, meaning we could just set the actual property. We can set request.name. Obviously give me an error because it's a private setter right now, which we could change. But there's no, just treat it as a data model. It doesn't need to be an aggregate. You don't need to be using the pattern if you don't have the need of requiring consistency within the aggregate. So where do you need consistency? What's an example? Let me show you. So here's an example of an aggregate that has order and order items. Kind of like I was diagramming at the very beginning of this video. I'm gonna show two reasons why you'd be wanting this related to consistency. So the first one down here is related to the order items and wanting to add them to our cart. So the idea here is it, say, it says, and it left, leaves a comment at this, is that when we're adding an item, you could specify a discount. And if we've, the discount is different, maybe we already have that uh, item in our order, we wanna use that new discount. So this is what this logic is. We're checking to see if the item exists already on the order. And if it does, then we're checking to see the discount that we're passing in, is it greater than the existing discount for that item? If our new discount is higher, then we wanna apply it for that line item. So that's when we just add the quantity, the units um, that we're adding to that. Otherwise, we're just adding that new item to our order. But this is the idea of consistency. We want everything to go to the root, to the order, so that we can apply this logic. We don't want some random code somewhere just being able to add uh, order items to our order. We want everything to be facilitated here so that we have consistency. So another reason why this aggregate root is very helpful is because there's two methods here that I'm illustrating because we're publishing domain events. Meaning we're publishing domain events about things that have actually occurred within the system. So the first method of set awaiting validation status, what happens is if that is in the right state, we can add that domain event of order status change to awaiting validation. And then there's gonna be some consumer that's expecting that and it's gonna uh, consume that and react to that when that occurs. Same thing with the set stock confirm status. We're publishing a domain event when that actually occurs. Now, same thing here. If we were just treating it as a data model and you could just willy nilly change the status, well, what happens if you set the status but don't publish it as this event? There's gonna be implications there because the event is expected to be published when that state change occurs. If you need an aggregate, use an aggregate because you have that problem. You need consistency. If you don't have that problem, don't create these pretend aggregates that have setter methods with, in my opinion, trivial validation logic that could be replaced with something like value objects where appropriate. Don't go down the mode of trying to use patterns or concepts because it's used as an example, it's a part of a tutorial when you don't actually have that problem. There's nothing wrong with just having a straight data model in a transaction script, if that's what the appropriate thing is. But adding useless indirection by forcing repositories with aggregates and you don't even have that problem is why you see the comment at the beginning where people are confused that they have to open 10 different files to make what seemingly should be a trivial change. If you found this video helpful, please give it a thumbs up. If you have any thoughts or questions, make sure to leave a comment and please subscribe for more videos on software architecture and design. Thanks.